Thank you, Kristen. Can everybody hear me? Okay, I've got this odd microphone on me now, which makes me think I'm giving a TED lecture, but I guarantee you I'm not giving a TED lecture. Okay, so um, it's an honor to be here at Gordon College. Thank you very much, all of you, for inviting me. I've enjoyed meeting some of you earlier today and look forward to meeting some more of you here and later this evening. Uh, so I, I'm going to talk for about half an hour, give or take, and then we'll have questions and answers, which I hope will be lively and provocative. I actually think is, uh, that the questions and answers are probably more important than the lecture, but I'll start things off with a lecture, short lecture, in which I will um, try to get you to think a little differently about a lot of familiar things and, and also show you that, at least in theory, there is a way to make capitalism vibrant, ecologically sustainable, and socially equitable. And to do that, to make capitalism like that, I think is, is the challenge for your generation. So my talk today actually has two subjects. Uh, one is the headline subject, the case for citizen shares, which is a very concrete proposal, sometimes referred to, or you may have heard the phrase universal basic income. It's related to that. Everybody gets some amount of money automatically uh, with no means test. Everybody gets it. It's, it's a basic right. Uh, that's an old idea, but it's, it's coming back into uh, parlance because times actually demand it. Um, so I'm going to talk about that, but I'm also going to talk about the larger framework for a new or upgraded capitalist operating system. So I'll start with the latter and then conclude with the specific case for citizens' share. Um, okay, so I don't know, uh, there's a lot of talk going around these days of some uh, kind of an aspirational vision that a lot of people hold, which is loosely referred to as a new economy. Uh, there are a lot of organizations out there, if you search Google, that have something, you know, new economy coalition some arrangement of words that, that includes new economy. I'm, there's actually, I am on the board of something called the Schumacher Center for a New Economy, which is based in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, inspired by uh, the thoughts of, of E.F. Schumacher, an English economist. Um, so, um, what does that mean? What, what is a new economy? What are people thinking about when they talk about a new economy today? And how might we ever get to whatever that new economy is? There are two ways to think about a new economy, uh, from the bottom up and from the top down. Um, when most people think or talk about a new economy, they imagine one that is more local than global, more sharing than exploitative, more respectful of the earth than of profit. They envision a proliferation of cooperatives, land trusts, farmers markets, small artisanal businesses. That's the ground level view, and it's all cool. But it's also necessary to look at the new economy from the top and to think about what kind of an operating system is needed to make this kind of ground level economy as opposed to the Walmart or Amazon type economy we have today, make this new ground level economy thrive and keep it thriving indefinitely. So right now, if we look from the top down at capitalism as we know it, um, 
the dominant rule, or, or as I like to say, algorithm. Does everybody understand algorithm? Okay. Uh, is to maximize the growth of capital above any and all other goals. That's what drives corporations today, is perhaps even more so than it did in the past for a variety of reasons. And other goals like saving the environment or having a large middle class uh, don't really drive uh, the market. Uh, they are incidental results if they happen, and unfortunately they're not happening. Um, so we have today, under this current form of capitalism, global corporations, global banks, more billionaires than ever, and at the same time we have climate change, which is, I don't even know what to say about it. it it's ultimately devastating. Uh, we have the decline of good paying jobs and, and ever widening economic inequality and social inequality in our country. Now many people are, are aware of this, this is not news, but even though people are aware, what they often say is, yeah, that's how capitalism works, but what can we do about it? Uh, we've tried socialism, or not necessarily we, but other countries have tried socialism or communism, and they don't work. So um, uh, we're kind of stuck with capitalism, including all of its flaws. Um, well, I do agree that we are stuck with capitalism, I mean, which is not all bad, as I will say later. But I don't think it has to be the kind of runaway capitalism that we have today. We can upgrade our operating system just the way Apple and Microsoft are constantly upgrading their operating systems. Um, so that the new operating system includes some breaks, some self-correcting mechanisms that keep the whole system from going too far toward planetary destruction and ever-widening inequality. Self-correcting mechanisms, that's the key, and they're missing now. Now, in the past, uh, many of us have assumed that government would play this role of fixing the harms that the market creates. Um, but, unfortunately, sad to say, we now know that government also fails to do that job effectively. Because in reality, you know, despite the theories of how democracy should work, it's just a fact that private corporations and banks pretty much dominate government and use government for their own ends to help them maximize their returns. And that begins with avoiding taxes uh, and going, goes all the way to allowing monopolies and oligopolies to extract vast amounts of unearned income. So we need another solution, not socialism, not communism, but not capitalism as we know it, some other form of capitalism. And this, this is what I've been thinking and writing about for quite a while. And um, it's where citizen shares, uh, as you'll see, comes in. So, to get started now, I want to uh, just have us ref uh, delve into some things that we are familiar with, but actually have a little more meaning or different meaning as I see them than you may be used to. So we talk about citizenship, uh, and typically we talk about that in a political context. Uh, Thanks to our Constitution, we have a variety of political rights, free speech and uh, trial by jury and so forth, and the vote being the most important political right. Uh, we don't often talk about economic 
citizenship, but I, I think we should. I think there are important economic rights of citizenship, um, some of which exist, although we don't really think of them as rights. You know, everybody has a right to sell their own labor. Everybody has a right to start a business. Well, that's great, but uh, most of these rights don't really, they benefit the rich more than everybody else. So, uh, but the kind of economic citizenship that I'm thinking about is one which actually goes further than these and guarantees everybody a right as a citizen, as a participant in our economy, to have some little piece of ownership and income that would flow from that ownership. That, I think, should be seen as, an, uh, as a right of economic citizenship. Um, another thing I want to just get out there, because it's integral to what I have been writing and thinking about, is that there are actually two kinds of wealth. Uh, the one we're most familiar with, which is private wealth, owned by ourselves or corporations, and we all know what that is. Private property, stocks, bonds, real estate, and so forth. And everything we can fit in the shopping bag. Uh, and then there's commonwealth, which is much less visible, but actually far more valuable than private wealth. I like to think of commonwealth as kind of the dark matter of the economic universe. Uh, it's not very well organized, and um, as a result of that, it's being rapidly diminished. Uh, so there are, there are many kinds of commonwealth. And, and what do I mean by commonwealth? Let me just say, it, it, it refers to uh, wealth that we all inherit together or co-create together uh, and it includes many many things that are actually quite disparate in lots of ways uh, ranging from natural gifts, gifts of creation if you will that are given to everybody uh, equally and which we also have a responsibility to preserve for future generations and other species, um, to socially created forms of commonwealth, uh, all the knowledge that we inherit, the technologies, the systems of our economy, the financial system, the communication system, the internet, the transportation system, the education systems, all these things, uh, contribute enormously to our well-being. Um, and they're not, you know, bits and pieces of them are privately owned, but as wholes, they are shared by all of us. So that's the big uh, pot of commonwealth. But within that, there are some important distinctions, and I just want to mention one. I've mentioned the distinction between natural wealth and socially created wealth, but another uh, important distinction is between commonwealth that is now and probably should uh, be free to use, open access, like things in the public domain. Um, you wouldn't want to change their freeness. Um, but also other forms of commonwealth that might be free now, but that we really ought to charge something for. Uh, you know, and the simplest example of that is our streets in a city uh, and the parking spaces. Uh, yes, it's a commons, the streets are a commons and people can park anywhere they want, but the reason we uh, charge and make people put money in meters is that it's a scarce resource. There are only so many parking spaces on our streets and we don't want a small number of people to hog them all. So we make people pay and we time, we limit their use and then everybody gets to share this common resource. Um, now, so that's, I've talked a little bit about, oops, am I going backwards? Sorry about that. Commonwealth. 
Uh, now let's flip back to capitalism. And um, so I should say very strongly that capitalism has many virtues. Uh, it certainly has been a very effective answer to the scarcity of goods that, you know, a couple centuries ago we were all faced by that. Capitalism does a fantastic job of producing an incredible variety of goods. So that's its main virtue. Uh, but there are several really, I call them tragic flaws, in part to respond to what Garrett Hardin wrote many years ago about the tragedy of the commons, if you will recall that. Um, I believe that was a, a terribly damaging uh, paper that has confused people for many, many years about the commons, as if the commons was the cause of its own self-destruction. Uh, that is not the case. Uh, it's basically markets that, that, that destroy commons. Um, but anyway, so I, well, I want to point out that markets or capitalism as it is organized now has several tragic flaws. One is pollution. Uh, capitalism, there are no, you know, in, in the process of maximizing their profits, corporations have to dump wastes somewhere and they like to do it for free and they do. And the result is what we all know. Uh, it's called externalizing costs. It's a market, it's a massive market failure which could destroy the planet. Uh, another tragic flaw is widening inequality. Now, I'm a baby boomer uh, and when I was growing up in the period, you know, decades after World War II, it didn't seem like inequality was such a huge problem. Uh, there was a growing middle class, which I was part of, and uh, I uh, assumed, and actually it, it happened, that I got to be better off, you know, still middle class, but better off than my parents. And everybody then assumed that that would just continue, that generation after generation, uh, we'd all get better off economically. Uh, and that that was kind of the inherent nature of capitalism in America. Well, since the 1980s, that has shifted for a variety of reasons. And in hindsight, I think it appears that the, the sort of golden age of the middle class after World War II is not the norm, but an aberration. And what we're seeing today is really the norm, the way capitalism really works which is it does concentrate wealth at the top. And there's a lot, and Thomas Piketty wrote his book about that, and there's a lot of theories we can go into about why that happens, but that is, I think, the reality, that capitalism as it is now designed does that. And the last thing I'll just mention is babies, future generations. Uh, capitalism does not have anybody or the mar markets don't have anybody protecting the interests of future generations, so inevitably they get cheated. Um, can we fix these flaws? Well, maybe, um, at least theoretically. And uh, so in my book, Capitalism 3.0, I talk a lot about how we could fix these flaws, and essentially there were three main things to do that would fix all three. Um, one is to organize some parts, critical parts of this pot of common wealth uh, so that into a kind of format I generically call trusts. Trusts are, are legal entities like corporations. They have a lot of the powers of corporations. They have governing boards. They're accountable, legally accountable to designated beneficiaries. They've been around for hundreds of years. Uh, but they haven't 
been applied very largely to commonwealth. So I think we should do that. For example, a sky trust. Just think about that as a thought experiment. What if there was a trust that owned the atmosphere or in the case of a country like us, our piece of the global atmosphere. And um, the trust was responsible for not maximizing profit as a corporation would be, but for preserving the asset for future generations. So that's a different form of governance. And I think there are important parts of the commons that need that kind of governance. Otherwise, they will be destroyed by the market. Right now, they're, they're naked. They don't have any protection except whatever government may or may not do, which is not enough. Um, so that's part one of the ways to upgrade the system to fix the first flaw on the previous slide. Uh, I think I may have gotten these out of order. Anyway, second thing I have there is a valve. Now, what do I mean by a valve? Well, we need these self-correcting mechanisms that can slow down the juggernaut when it's going too far or too fast in, in one direction, whether it, it's destruction of nature or widening inequality. So there have to be valves um, that can be turned and some people or institution that do the turning, and that would be you know, tr the trusts. Um, Think of the Federal Reserve just as a kind of analogy. It's a board with a you know, set of responsibilities, and they turn a couple of valves that are related to the money supply. So that kind of model. You could think of an atmospheric trust or a sky trust turning valves that relate to how much pollution uh, goes into the asset under management. Um, and the last upgrade that we need is something to do with paying dividends, with sharing the wealth of our economy, not entirely equally. You know, inequality is necessary and inevitable. Entrepreneurs, et cetera, investors, risk takers do need to be re rewarded. Uh, but the extreme uh, inequality is not necessary and, and extremely harmful, as a matter of fact. And the simplest and most efficient way to deal with that problem is actually just to give everybody a certain amount of money taken from some of the unearned wealth that currently goes to the top. Now, that brings us to citizen shares. As, as I said, this is just a name that I have put on a concept that has been around for some time and has a variety of names, um, one of which is universal basic income. You may have heard that. There's a lot of interest actually in, in several European countries now about instituting a form of universal uh, basic income. Uh, citizen shares is a, not exactly synonymous with that because it has a different structure, uh, but the end result is largely the same, which is giving everybody a certain amount of regular guaranteed money every month uh, without a means test uh, and without having to have a job. Horrid. You'd probably want to have a job anyway because it wouldn't be enough to live on, but it's kind of a supplement to what you can earn in the labor market. Um, so. The case that I want to make for citizen shares uh, has three parts to it, and I'll go through them all quickly. Um, the philosophic part is pretty simple, and it really goes back to the founding philosophy of our country. Uh, I'm sure these words are familiar to you, and I highlighted a couple of them. Uh, equal, that's self-explanatory. Rights, uh, and or unalienable rights. And that's something that is non-negotiable. You know, it's, it is a right that every living person 
has just for being alive because the creator endowed them with those rights. That is a powerful concept, the concept of rights. And you probably are learning all about that in class, so I don't need to say any more about that. Uh, and liberty, also self-explanatory. And pursuit of happiness, that's very interesting. Anyway, um, if these are, if liberty and pursuit of happiness are indeed unalienable rights that belong equally to all of us, because the creator endowed us with these rights, put that in the context of economic reality, and I think it's safe to say that uh, without economic security for everybody, there can't be liberty. If you don't have economic security, you're struggling to survive. You don't have any freedom. You're totally stressed out. You don't have any opportunity to pursue happiness. You can only pursue happiness if you have a base of economic security. So that is the philosophical argument for citizen shares. Uh, the ecological argument has to do with the astonishing fact that we are entering a new geological age, which is sometimes called the Anthropocene, which is a statement of the fact that humans are now a geological, a planetary geological force that is reshaping the entire planet for better, but more likely for worse. Uh, this has never happened before. And in order to avoid the worst consequences of the Anthropocene, in order to get through it somehow, we have to protect the Earth's ecosystems from the human economy. And that uh, requires putting those valves in, as I mentioned earlier, and putting trusts or trustees who are accountable to future generation in charge of those valves. But here's the uh, uh, related point. If you are going to limit uh, the flow, let's say, of pollution into uh, an ecosystem, uh, you automatically uh, create a price. You, you make what was previously not scarce, scarce. It was scarce in a real sense, but not in an economic sense. Markets didn't perceive the scarcity. So when you put a valve on it and let's say issue permits and sell permits, that's how the valve works, uh, you create uh, a new income stream that isn't, doesn't exist now. And it, it could be a very large income stream. And um, I argue that m most, if not all, of that income stream should be paid to all of us as this form of income, citizens' share. Uh, and then the economic uh, case. Uh, well, I, I throw this up here because as a young person, I played Monopoly all the time. Do, do you guys still play Monopoly, or is it so last century? It's a little, yeah, it's kind of a last century thing. Uh, but you know about it? You know the basic concept? Uh, so Monopoly is a very interesting game. Um, and in some ways, it, it, it reflects uh, our actual economy. In other ways, it's, it's actually different. Uh, the way it reflects, the most important way it, it re reflects our actual economy is that there's a lot of rent involved, which you know makes some people get rich and other people go bankrupt. Um, and you know there there. Are, two types of games. There are winner-take-all games, and then there are games where you have a winner, but uh, that doesn't mean that the winner takes all, you know. The winner just has more than the other people. 
Uh, monopoly is a winner-take-all game. I wouldn't say our actual economy is totally winner-take-all, but it's mostly winner-take-all. Uh, and that is something that needs to be changed. Now, um, I should just mention that there are some aspects of monopoly that are really cool, really good, and, and actually fit into the paradigm that I've been discussing. Um, one is that everybody starts off equally. Everybody gets a certain amount of capital at the beginning. Nobody inherits any extra money and has a, 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 an advantage from birth. So that's good. And the other thing is that uh, everybody gets, ooh, it's crossed off. Everybody gets a certain amount of money for pass and go. So, um, and um, that's like a dividend. And it um, goes to everybody, and it's really important uh, economically because without it, uh, you wouldn't have enough money to buy the property, which is arguably you hope will make you rich. You know, you need to circulate money in an economy to, so people can participate in the economy. And if you don't circulate enough, it's not good for the economy. Um, so, I'm getting to the end here. Um, so, again, the economic case uh, is at a macro level, uh, these are what would happen if you actually had citizen shares or universal income, regardless of where the, well, I shouldn't say that. Okay, it would basically eliminate poverty, uh, preserve our middle class, which, and, and the reason that's in there is because Wages are dropping. This, this is the reality. The jobs of the future are not going to pay as much as the jobs of the past for a whole lot of reasons, which we can get into in the Q&A if you want to. So somehow, if we want to have a middle class, and I think it's a very good idea to have a large middle class, we have to supplement wage income. Um, here's the non-economic aspect, but I throw that in because uh, a citizen share that is in part derived from protecting ecosystems would perform that function, which is very important. And it would, just like giving players money when they pass go, it stimulates economic activity, which we actually need to do uh, nowadays. Um, so, to get back, at Lastly, to this idea of a new economy. I see citizen shares, money that goes to everybody every month. You can get wired, have it wired to your bank account, take it out of your ATM machine. It's not a tax credit, it, it's real cash. Uh, I see that as the core of the new economy. Uh, aside from all those macro things that I was just talking about, just looking at it at the individual level, um, you can imagine yourself how it would affect your life. Um, you'd probably have less stress in your life. You'd probably think of yourself as having more opportunity both to like start a business or to pursue further education or to um, do work that you really like to do, but it isn't particularly well rewarded in the market, but now you have more chance to do work you like to do, or just to spend more time with your family. Uh, there are so many that contribute in non-remunerative ways to your community. There is so much good that would come from giving people economic security, uh, that uh, the, the benefits, I think, are, are just so huge. You can't quantify them very easily, but I think in terms of freedom and pursuing happiness, they're, they're massive. So that's it. Uh, I would love to answer your questions and, and hear your comments. So, and, and we have a mic system over here for questioners, so thank you.